Uh, all right, let, let's get started. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Jinghua Zhao, Professor of Cities and Transportation at MIT. Uh, welcome to the MIT Mobility Forum designed by the MIT Mobility Initiative. Uh, today, I really have the great pleasure to have Professor Henry Liu join us to talk about the safety assessment of autonomous vehicle. Uh, as we know, AV, after years of substantial investment and effort, uh, finally getting to a point that uh, potential large-scale deployment, we see Waymo in San Francisco, in Phoenix, Apollo Go in Wuhan, China, et cetera. But remain a question, how do we trust this machine to be deployed on the urban streets or broader scale? Do, and when we say we trust, we mean by the general public, uh, the insurance company, the regulators, based on what criteria we evaluate, right? So at the technical level, uh, later Professor Henry Liu will, will really describe, because the curse of dimensionality means the driving environment is such a complex situation. You need a lot of a variable to represent it. But also, unfortunately, in a way, or fortunately, combined with the curse of a rarity, a rarity, meaning the safety critical event are rare, which from system point of view, that's great. Of course, we want it to be rare. But from the learning and assessment point of view, that makes means that most of the data are irrelevant, right? So therefore, our training validation process is highly inefficient. So that's the first challenge. The second one is from the process uh, point of view. Most of the complex safety testing programs are development, developed by the private industry. So they are, by definition, proprietary. So from the public point of view, they are hidden, right? So for both issues, I'm really glad that Professor Henry Liu is here today talk about both his methodological contribution in terms of developing the dense deep reinforcement learning approach to really accelerate the evaluation process, but also a process contribution and the practical contribution by building the MCT safety assessment program. That's a two-part protocol to test the behavior of this autonomous vehicle, right? So I really my great pleasure to have Professor Liu joining us here. Uh, just let me, before I formally introduce Professor Liu, I do want to reinforce the norm of this, uh, this forum, which is everybody contribute one idea to the discussion, uh, either in the form of question to Professor Liu or a comment to Professor Liu. Please type it directly into, into the chat, right? Uh, also, uh, just to uh, bring people's uh, attention a little bit to the discussion, I want everyone to type into the chat to the following question. What, are the, what is the one concern you have about the AV deployment? What is the one concern you have about the AV deployment, right? I will invite people to contribute into the chat on this. Meanwhile, let me introduce Dr. Henry Liu is the Bruce Grins uh, Shield College Aid Professor of Engineering, also the director of the MCT program at the University of Michigan, I number. He's uh, a professor both in the civil and environmental engineering, as well as a professor of mechanical engineering. He also directs the Center for Connected and Automated Transportation, a US DOT founded regional university transportation center. His research lies in the intersection between three things, transportation engineering, automotive engineering, and artificial intelligence. His research laid the foundation for the cyber physical transportation system, particularly the development of a smart traffic signal system with connected vehicle, as well as the testing and evaluation of autonomous vehicle, which is today's uh, uh, focus of the session here. He worked on his work on the safety validation of autonomous vehicle has been featured in the Nature as the cover story. Uh, he's also the managing director of the Journal of Intelligence Transportation System and a board member of the ITS America and the IEEE ITS Society. Uh, let me pass the forum to Professor Henry Liu. Henry, please. Jinghua, thank you so much. Let me um, share my slide. Um, Full screen. Yeah. Can you see one. my slide? Yes, right. Okay. All right. Again, Jinghua, thank you so much. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I remember I was there um, in MIT um, in person um, um, a little less than two years ago um, talking about similar topics. So I want to talk discuss with you in terms of safety assessment for autonomous vehicles and, and this has been really um, a hot topic for, uh, from both um, industry, uh, academia, as well as government agencies. I want to start with just a little bit overview in terms of autonomous vehicle technology. And it started uh, really in terms of intense development uh, from 2004 DAPA Autonomous Vehicle Challenge. 
And then 2009, uh, Google start with the Google X project. And then you that's the first time you see the potential um, to have a commercial product on autonomous vehicle. And then, um, you know, really the interest to this technology peaked at uh, 2016 or 2017, a number of the OEMs um, announced that they will be mass producing these uh, autonomous vehicles by 2020. Um, obviously we are 2024, we do not really have any commercial available autonomous vehicle. And then by 2022, Fortune Magazine has a uh, article on a long coat window is here for self-driving cars. And so you can see that uh, people has the, the, the confidence and, and to have mass production, mass production of this technology has been uh, greatly reduced. And then particularly last year, um, Cruise has an uh, accident on, on the street of San Francisco. And then following that, they shut down their operation and they are, um, I, as far as I, I can tell from um, um, last month or a couple of months or, um, uh, uh, ago, uh, and they resumed some of the operations uh, on the street. And then, um, also, we see some of the more um, uh, encouraging news uh, related with uh, new generation of startups um, getting money. Uh, we uh, uh, get uh, uh, funding for a billion dollars led by SoftBank and further develop this technology. So you can see that um, the roller coaster wave related with this technology development. And the main reason I think uh, for this, um, for this roller coaster uh, of this uh, autonomous vehicle technology, is really the con major concern on the safety performance. And we know that in the U.S., um, on the national level, in terms of com in, in combination with all the drivings together, um, the accident rate is probably around half million miles or something like that. Um, but in the urban setting, is much the accident rate is it's, um, it's much higher. And then we do not have a large scale deployment for autonomous vehicle yet. So um, um, California DMV has asked all the testing to report in terms of their um, uh, disengagement with autonomous driving system. And the disengagement rate uh, by 2022 is roughly about 10,000 miles or a little higher than 10,000 miles. There's also all sorts of report, um, all sorts of report coming from um, the autonomous vehicle developers and talking about how safe is their vehicles, Vima, Cruise, and, and others, they all, and Tesla, they all have their uh, report in terms of their safety performance. And by and large, uh, I think the, that safety performance is safe to say, safety performance is still a major concern um, by regular consumers uh, for this autonomous vehicle technology. So I want to, uh, as Xinhua mentioned, I want to talk a little bit why it's so challenging for us. And, and there's, I see this is two major challenge. And um, the first challenge is sort of in the curse of dimensionality space. What it really means is if you look at it in terms of driving environment, if it's, if it's in combination of different weather conditions, different road infrastructure, and different road users, and each user has their own behavior in terms of their maneuver of the vehicles. And so this um, space, uh, the driving environment become very um, complex. The good news is that by 2012 and 13, there's this technology called uh, uh, deep learning. And, uh, and the with deep learning, we can handle these complex environments. So the traditional wisdom in, in terms of the curse of dimensionality sort of fade away um, for autonomous vehicles. And that's also why in two, by 2016 and 17, um, people had so much confidence that you know, within a few years, you know, this technology will be mature enough so we, they will be able to mass produce um, the autonomous vehicle. Well, unfortunately, during the process, they find there's, you know, really, um, there's another challenge. And I summarized that into um, another curse I called the uh, curse rarity. And on your left, it shows you basically it's this is coming from Google's uh, one of the videos in 2019. You can see the autonomous vehicle crossing this um, uh, the intersection with a green light, but at the time there's an um, emergency vehicle coming cross street, and the vehicle the autonomous vehicle has to be able to recognize that vehicle properly stop and wait that yield to um, to that vehicle and 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 then go. 
cases like this, um, the frequency uh, of occurrence um, uh, is much, much lower than the normal driving situation. And the, um, the uh, capability developed needed to be able to handle this type of situation is much uh, higher, right? So the requirement for that is much higher. So that's why if you look at it in terms of, you know, the occurring probability and then on the long tail side of things, then you, you, it's, it's much more difficult to, um, to handle the development cost. It's much higher on that. And so um, we, if you look at it in terms of the deep learning, regardless what, you know, what type of network structure it is, Essentially, we're looking at this data, right? So uh, it has a, you know, sort of uh, coming from the um, uh, the real world being collected or uh, synthesized data, um, and essentially we're trying to, um, you know, um, establish the mapping between the input and output with this function f, and, and theta is essentially is the parameters within that model, right? Um, and so um, most of the deep learning model is also based upon back propagation uh, approach. And then so the gradient become very important. We need to estimate the gradient and then uh, by uh, estimating the gradient so that we can adjust the parameter eventually. And so if you think about the data and, and, and in particularly for, safe, uh, for deep learning model to handle these um, safety critical cases, but most of the data um, in the, for, for very large portion of these are normal driving. The safety critical event are, are much lesser, right? So, and if you put it all together, train your neural network, and then you can imagine in central that theta, the variance of that theta and that parameter become much, the gradient, be, uh, variance of the gradient become a lot larger. And so because you have a very large variance, and eventually what you will feel, it, what, what you will tell is that that neural network didn't really learn enough things to be able to handle this type of safety critical event. Okay, so I summarized that in the paper we published this year called Curse of, Curse of Dimensionality for Autonomous Vehicles in Nature Communication. Um, and then um, the safety challenge is really to me is the combination of the Curse of dimensionality with the curse, curse of uh, uh, rarity, and they are on top of each other. And the current deep learning algorithm has a difficulty to handle these. And this occurs not only for autonomous vehicle, but for other autonomous systems as well. It has both uh, both of this uh, ha has this type of challenge as well, and it also occurs in many different components with autonomous vehicle technology. It's also on the perception, it's, it's on planning, and on the validation as well. So this is the, you know, the famous paper from Rand Corporation um, in 2017. It shows that uh, it's very, very, um, it take a, a very costly, time consuming to really validate the safety performance for autonomous vehicle. And that's a known issue for a really long time. So, so and, and because of the curse of rarity and also the curse of dimensionality. So to offer some of the, um, to, to, before I start to explain some of the work we are doing, I want to put this into more, um, you know, um, uh, of the, the problem more, uh, in terms of how we formulate this problem. What exactly is safety testing for autonomous vehicle? And so essentially you're trying to drive this basic procedure, you drive the autonomous vehicle, you know, naturalistic driving environment for n time or n miles, and, and it's you know experienced m events, and that m divided by n, that's essentially is your estimated accident rate. Okay, so that's the A here is the probability, X is this this essentially is this driving environment. And so um m divided by n, it's become your um your uh, accident rate. And so now, um, in order to do that, then um, particularly in simulation, um, and then we will need to model exactly in terms of P of X, right? So the probability of this joint distribution in terms of this driving environment. And now you can, you can have all sorts of variables uh, surrounding vehicles, infrastructure, and weather, and whatever it is. And we're trying to come, with, come up with the probability, uh, joint probability of that space. Well, um, and then to estimate m by n, um, essentially, um, you because the space is so big, and so you need to drive, you need to drive so many miles, 
and then the, to accumulate in terms of enough in terms of extent to estimate those. And so that's what the run paper was talking about. And there's, there's uh, in statistics, there's important sampling approach. And now um, in order to speed it up, we want to not sample from the naturalistic driving environment, which is P of X. We want to sample for, uh, from an importance function, which in this case is Q. And so the question really, the, the trick is what QX will look like and how you're gonna you know, construct this new um, you know, uh, probability function so that you can estimate the extent rate unbiasedly. Okay, so fortunately um, we have proved that in, the, in, the, in our paper that this QX need to be proportioned to two things. One is contribution to the gradient and the other one is the the uh, the probability itself in terms of that that uh, um, um, situation, and and so that's why this approach, our approach, becomes a naturalistic and atmospheric driving environment because in order for us to um, calculate this gradient, this gradient is very difficult to calculate, and so we substitute that uh, into approximation of that. And, and particularly in our case, and we, we also look at in terms of the safety critical event that include two type of event. And one type of event is related with near misses and the other type of event, which is the crush. And so we put it together, then this become a naturalistic and adversarial driving environment. All right, so then the, our safety validation approach is really to develop the, um, the naturalistic driving environment and then be able to also to uh, further develop this into naturalistic and adversarial driving environment so that we can do two things. One is we ensure the estimation on biasedness. The other one is we want to accelerate. So the efficiency need to be improved because uh, otherwise it take too long to validate um, uh, the result. Okay, so our approach to establish this naturalistic driving environment is coming from real data. And a lot of our work is based upon infrastructure-based data. We have been you know, instrumenting heavily in the city of Ann Arbor and to collect the data. And so this is one of the intersections I want to show you. This is a, um, one of the probably most dangerous intersections in the city of Ann Arbor. Um, it's a two-lane roundabout. And then we put the cameras, um, a grid, uh, the fisheye cameras at each of the corner. And then we do object detection tracking and do prediction as well. Okay, And we project back to the Google map. More importantly, because we want to be able to evaluate the safety performance for autonomous vehicles if it's deployed in Ann Arbor, then we want to capture these near misses as, as well as the, the, um, uh, the accident. And so I want to show you, this is one of the accidents that we are, um, you know, we, from our collected data. Um, so you can see this, you know, uh, um, Alderland uh, vehicles, you're not supposed to, um, turn left, and but that vehicle turned left, and then the inner lane vehicle want to get out. That's why this read, uh, lead to the red angle crash, and this occurs in 2022, and then this is also verified by uh, the police report. Um, and then um, on the right hand side, there's another very similar lo location, similar type of situation, and then um, um, this is uh, near me, and. Uh, what we have found out, we have a lot of near misses. You know, we have lots of near misses occurs, and, and in this particular intersection, the accident rate is, you know, every on average, um, it's about uh, 17 accident per uh, per year. And so every month there's six, seven, uh, five, six of these uh, these accident. But we every month we have four, five hundreds of these near misses being captured in our system, and so uh, then we use that to train our model to, uh, to uh, ensure the accident rates are similar, not only overall accident rate, but also in terms of each subcategory, um, the accident also um, uh, to be, uh, in terms of the accident rate is consistent. Um, and, and so we use the transformer to, uh, to model the, the behavior of these vehicles. And, but more importantly, we have a safety mapping in, in, in some of the situations, some of the unreasonable uh, accident will occur, we will need to correct those. 
And so that's the network we um, we we built, and that was a paper we published last year in Nature Communication as well. And so just to show you in terms of what happens, you can see the data we collected from the real world on the left, and then similarly, you will be able to see uh, some of the uh, situations we can replicate from our simulation model. All right. So we have this naturalistic driving environment. Again, the, 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 the second part of the work, we need to accelerate, right? To, to improve the efficiency, we need to, you know, really make the, uh, the, um, the simulation model not only just replicating naturalistic driving environment, but also, you know, accelerate and then to have the adversarial driving environment as well. So our approach is really trying to have, to train these surrounding use uh, surround, surrounding road users or so background vehicles to balance between the naturalistic, naturalistic behavior versus adversarial behavior, right? So, so that's the, essentially that's the, uh, the approach. So when we published this last year um, um, and then um, Wall Street Journal has a picture really illustrated in terms of what we're trying to do. We're trying to, you know, um, to imagine you have surrounding vehicles, some of the vehicles, um, the drivers might be bad drivers and they uh, has dangerous behaviors and, and they occur quite often. And then to challenge automated vehicle to see whether that will be accident. But doing this in a way that will be consistent in terms of what's happening in the real world. Okay. And so um, then we come up with this, what we call um, dense deep reinforcement learning approach. We formulate the problem as a, um, 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 reinforcement learning, and then we're trying to gather the data, um, particular safety critical events together to train the neural network to learn in what situation, uh, which vehicle take what maneuver at what probability to challenge automated vehicle. And so um, to do so, um, we will need to make some edit to uh, the data and some of the situations for if it's it's all, no, all normal driving situation, we just basically discard that data. And then if it's part of the data um, in terms of the transition process from normal driving to safety critical event, then we, you know, we, we edit this um, uh, Markovian process and so that we can densify the data. So in this case, the dense deep reinforcement learning, the main work is on the data preparation. We're trying to densify the data so that the background, when we train the background vehicle, they learn in what situation, uh, what time, what probability to challenge automated vehicle. Okay, so this is uh, what video basically show you, you know, uh, this is in Carla, we show you in some of the situations that, uh, you know, um, the blue vehicle is essentially the, um, um, the automated vehicle and the, the green vehicles are the surrounding vehicles. These vehicles are being trained to create scenarios for automated vehicle and, and the, to be dangerous and and um, and to challenge automated vehicle. And so this is another situation that result eventually result into a crash. So this this uh, red box shows the vehicle at that moment is being selected to take challenging maneuvers to challenge automated vehicle when it may eventually lead into some, some uh, safety critical situations. Okay. And then, so we put it all together um, and, and put these two together. And then that's why we developed the MCD safety assessment program. And this, this program really is trying to um, um, test, uh, doing behavior testing for autonomous vehicles and they have two parts. One is sort of uh, more on behavior competency some of the basic behavior competency, and, and then this is what we call driver licensing test. And so-called driver licensing test is essentially is based upon the operation design domain of the vehicle. And also then we choose uh, scenarios which occurs within that ODD, and then apply the approach uh, we have talked about in terms of how we, um, um, uh, uh, how we uh, create these naturally driving environment and how we accelerate. And so for each of the scenario, we will need to do multiple times. The parameter is randomized. And then uh, we uh, want to see whether the vehicle will be able to handle some of the situations when uh, what will be the accident rate in certain type of um, uh, scenarios. 
And, um, um, and then the second part is more comprehensive. So it's not just within certain scenarios, but you put it into a sort of a city level situation. Um, in our case, we put it into M city and then they will drive within M city and then we will uh, generate these, you know, sort of background vehicles and these background vehicle are challenging, uh, make challenging uh, maneuvers to the vehicle and see what will be the overall accident rate, particularly in comparison to human drivers. And then um, just this week, um, um, I, I actually did an interview with uh, Associated Press um, um, uh, last week. And this week, uh, there's a news article come out. And uh, um, basically, I was, call, I was trying to encourage the federal government to take actions to develop some safety testing framework to um, improve the, act, the confidence of consumers and also to help autonomous vehicle companies in terms of how to do the safety validation of their uh, of their vehicles. Okay, so um, in terms of um, um, these uh, MAM City Safety Assessment Program, I want to give you some, you know, in terms of how we do it at MAM City as a test facility, right? So, so this this is one of the um, tests we did in the in the winter time in in uh, in Michigan, um, and you can see this is autonomous vehicle coming across the intersection at the time. There's a left turn. Uh, vehicles we want to see, and that left turn vehicle did not really yield to the autonomous vehicle. We want to see whether the vehicle will be able to handle uh, some of the situation that does. And you do it multiple times and with multiple parameters, uh, randomized parameter, you see whether you know this type of situation they can handle. And uh, on your right hand side, um, it shows you know there's a, a, a automated vehicle approaching across the intersection at the time that was pedestrian jay walking. And we want to see whether the autonomous vehicle will be handle, will be able to handle some of the situation like that. And so this is a very um, simple case. Um, the pedestrian is adult pedestrian, but if you change the adult pedestrian into small child pedestrians proxy, then this become a lot more difficult um, uh, for autonomous vehicle um, to uh, recognize and re react to it. And then um, in terms of driver um, uh, driving intelligence tests, obviously it's become much more um, time consuming uh, because we're trying to get to in terms of overall accident rates of that. And so um, so then what we do is within MCD, we do really um, multiple um, um, hundreds of runs in terms of within MCD, and then we generate virtual vehicles and, and virtual vehicle each have a different, uh, you know, being trained and uh, they are trained to choose in at what time and which vehicle and uh, what maneuver um, they will do and they, with what probability. And that, again, that probability is much, much higher uh, than the normal driving situations. Because then in this case, we can accelerate the generation of, um, uh, uh, of the safety critical event. And so, so that they help us to, uh, you know, the, to estimate the, the accident rate a lot quicker. Okay, so um, the last thing I want to talk about is, um, you know, but, uh, I'm sitting as a test facility um, in the last a few, like two years have been funded by National Science Foundation to really um, further develop I'm City from a physical infrastructure, just like a miniature city into a, a com combination of physical infrastructure and digital infrastructure, particularly with the digital infrastructure development and also make it remotely accessible. So not just University of Michigan faculty can use it. Uh, we want to open up MCD so that people around the country um, can use it remotely as well. And so if you are a researcher, um, you have your own idea, um, uh, what MCD 2.0 project can help you is, first of all, we can provide the data, right? So we, you know, as I mentioned, uh, through the US DOT support, we've been instrumenting city and number, we get lots of data from um, the real world. And then a lot of these real data, uh, raw data is very difficult for researchers to use. Then we develop our MCD data engine so that we can pre-process the data and it's easier for uh, researchers to use the data. But more importantly, we also utilize the real world data as I mentioned, we develop these simulation models so that uh, these uh, representing the, these naturalistic driving environment. And then uh, if you, you know, down with our simulation model, then uh, we can also combine the simulation model running on the cloud 
and together with connect that with our physical infrastructure and through this uh, middleware we call MCDOS. And so now um, um, everything is on uh, the digital infrastructure is on the cloud. So from researchers perspective, you what you will do, you can do is you can run your own algorithm on your own desktop. And we have developed five different use cases, very typical for um, um, uh, typical research topics on autonomous vehicle, for example, related with autonomous vehicle perception system, planning system, the joint control of autonomous vehicle with infrastructure, and then teleoperation of the um, uh, of the autonomous vehicle, as well as distributed uh, testing, not just in the city, but in other places as well. And then so for researchers, and you can run your own uh, algorithm on your own desktop, and you send your control, uh, say your control vehicle, you send your control vehicle, uh, uh, control command to MCDOS. And then what in return, what MCDOS will forward you in terms of what happening in the simulation world, but also in the MCD physical world. And then um, um, the control command from the remote researchers they will be forwarded through Verizon's 5G system uh, to the physical infrastructure and, and also the vehicles as well and to execute, okay? And so we have, you know, and on the desktop, on the remote researchers, they can visualize in terms of what's happening in MCD for their testing. And after the test, the, all of the data will be archived on the cloud and, and the remote researcher will be, will, only the remote researcher will have access to it. So in this way, we retain the IP of the re researchers, but providing um, um, uh, testing service remotely. So this is just um, uh, we, um, some of the testing we are doing right now. Um, and this is one of the case, University of Washington is develop a joint control algorithm between vehicles and also traffic signals. So you can see um, on your right hand side, this is a simulation model with all the traffic lights and, and the background vehicle are generated with by MCD simulation model and, and uh, the control command for both traffic light and also for the for the vehicles are being forwarded to the physical vehicles in the test track and also the physical infrastructure of the test track. And um, city has all um, it's being covered by all but by ca by cameras, and so these cameras uh, view will be also show up on the remote researchers desktop, so they can visualize in terms of what's happening within my city, and and some of the some of the things happening. Um, related with what's the current latency from you know the remote researchers to the MCD vehicles in this case from the west coast to uh, essentially to the east, and and what's the current speed of the vehicle? What's the tar uh, differences between the current vehicle versus the vehicle in front? And what's the throttle uh, um, uh, angle and also the acceleration um, and things like that? So there's a set of things in real time the researcher can inspect in terms of what's happening as well. And we actually just have our open house event this week on Tuesday uh, and um, um, a number of people came in, um, um, about a hundred people. Um, and, and then uh, we demonstrate five different use cases. And uh, this, is, this is one of the use case uh, showing on a picture is this teleoperation. So uh, as you can see, um, the teleoperator in this case is um, Dr. Dan, Dan Linzel, who is the um, um, uh, National Science Foundation's CMMI division director. So he's trying; he's being trained now as a remote uh, teleoperator. And then, uh, in the in this particular case, we generate virtual um, um, uh, accident, and then the vehicle doesn't know what to do, and then call for the help, and then so. Dan was the one to uh, drive using the driving simulator to really control the vehicle, physical vehicle in the MCD test track, maneuver through, and then turn back to autonomous vehicle. So that's one of the use cases uh, we demonstrated as well. Okay, so I think I um, use up all my time probably, uh, I, I think 30 minutes roughly. Um, and um, these are the two, you know, a uh, uh, few papers we published and uh, you know, if you have interest, I'll welcome um, questions as well. Great. Yeah. Thank you so much, Professor Henry Leo. This is really exciting to see all the progress. Jinghua, I think you muted. Oh. 
I oh, oh I no 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 it's my problem. Uh, uh, okay. John, can you hear me? I think uh, I think yes, I can hear you. We now. can hear you, General. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. Okay, it's it's right. my, yeah. on my yes, own. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That, my um, yeah, speak. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Th yeah, thank my, you so speak, much, Harry. This is really exciting, uh, both on the real research, the methodical contribution, but also uh, M City 2.0 as a, a public service to the whole research community, right? Really, thank you for actually doing that and uh, make it available to all the other researchers there, right? Uh, particularly given just, the... just want to add on that is sure. we have an RFP online, so right now everybody can request to use M City for free. Um, it's be because NSF has already paid for it. <laughs> and so everybody can, if you want to use MCD, particularly um, with some of the uh, the use cases, the example use cases are online as well. You can check there's demos and, and things like that. So if you want to use it, um, you know, please send in your request. Wow, that, that's amazing. So the whole community should be grateful to, to your effort on, on this. Right. Uh, so let me start with you. Uh, one question on, uh, in the nature communication commentary you wrote this year, you mentioned about the curse of rarity. You propose three possible solutions. Here, yeah, right? yeah. I know today, you, because of the limited time, you only talk with the first one, basically. Can you share with us the, the second or third possible solution here? Yes. Um, so I propose three solutions. And, and the third, the, the second and third solution, one is leverage the current, atom, uh, current AI advancement, essentially to use generative AI. And so what generative AI can help us to do? Here in deep learning, in, the, in, in, in our current approach um, for deep learning, we are building mapping between input and output. And that's why this type of approach, we, you know, it's uh, oftentimes lead to the so-called seesaw effect. You know, you collect data, you find a problem, and you solve it. And well, another problem pops up. Maybe the uh, originally previously not not a problem, but now become a problem. Mm -hmm. So this is you know the, this is the problem with the current dense learning approach, uh, the the deep learning approach. And then so the generative AI can help. What generative AI can help us is not really just to build the mapping, in learning the driving skills, not just mapping between input output, but the learnings that how to drive. Remember, so my son is is nineteen now, but three years ago. Um, he was, you know, when he learned to drive, he learned to drive. I teach him in the parking lot, right? So, so essentially, he's he's learning that in a closed in a test track. Now and then after that, he can drive on the on on the um, um, on the public road. So he's learning the skills, and so the generative AI will enable us to learn the skills as well. So you, that's why you see the new generation or new. Um, um, you know, startup company, Wave is one of those leveraging generative AI to develop autonomous vehicle technology. So that's the second approach. I see there's great potential on that. The third approach is, can we get help from infrastructure? Mm. So it's, the first and second approach is all based upon vehicle, single vehicle, vehicle-centric um, technology. Can we get help from infrastructure? Can we, you know, inform the vehicle in in, 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 in in timely in terms of what's happening and to help um, get better information, situational awareness. So that's our, my, uh, uh, the third approach I propose. And all of these approaches are not exclusive to each other. It could be, uh, eventually could be a combination of these three. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So then uh, the, the message, the first message you proposed on the, basically densify the, the most relevant data here, right? Uh, by injecting this uh, accident or near misses through this Michigan crash report, et cetera, right? So one question commonly asked is that uh, uh, the AVs and a human driver may make different types of mistakes there, right? So what we will observe is the human driven cars distribution of the accident, but how do we tackle this uh, accident? We wouldn't know AV would make. It's maybe have a distinct distribution there, right? How do we handle those type of situations? Yeah, and, and that's that's uh, that's a great question. And then that's really um, why these autonomous vehicle companies are collecting data using their autonomous vehicles. Mm -hmm. So those are the data need to be collected. And so what we find out is uh, is is learning from failures in terms of accident 
is important, but it's more importantly is to learn from success, which is near near misses. And so when these vehicles experience these type of situation, they are avoided. Then what is the you know what is the situation and how did they handle that? And it's it's more important to put these type of data together. So that's that's essentially why I, when I show this 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 um, 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 the important function, they will construct the important function that basically include two type of data, and that's the data collection part you need, will need to collect for autonomous vehicle. I see. Not only learn from accident, but also learn from success. Oh, thank you. That that's good way to put it. So maybe the second set is more on the on the policy and the process side of a question, right? One is that uh, you mentioned the DMV report require the company reporting the disengagement. Uh, this this indicacy, as you mentioned, is being criticized a lot, right? It's not sufficient to represent what what's going on there. So if you are the you have the power to change the DMV requirements, say, what would be the fat parameter you think we should mandate to the AV company to report to the public? <laughs> well, I don't. I don't have the power, so I didn't really <laughs> think through uh, 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 on that, right? So. Um, um, but I think one of the things is um, really important is um, is to have the uh, capability to share some of the situations. Um, mm -hmm. You know, in the um, oftentimes um, people compare in terms of the automotive industry versus the airline industry. So mm -hmm. if you look at the airline industry, they have a lot more, um, um, I should say, a lot lower in terms of accident rates and then things like that. Can we learn from that? And, and in in when Things happens um, being investigated. All of the data is being shared, and so that's why um, we learn from a lot of these past uh, uh, failures. Um, and and, and um, in the automotive industry, is a lot more difficult, uh, and it's because we have lots of more, lot lot a lot more players, and and the technology is more um, you know proprietary in this case. And so um, so data sharing is. Super, super important. I know um, even um, in terms of not only just obviously the preparatory part portion to themselves is not uh, um, 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 public available, but you know portion of that could be public available and then um, uh, public available. And one of the things I want to mention um, when Wemo opens up, uh, they are, there's open data sets on, on their um, um, uh, on their web page, they have half million of these, you know, um, uh, scenarios they collected and make it open, uh, openly available. And that itself stimulate a lot of the research, a lot of the new methodologies being developed. So, I, I mean, I truly encourage these, there's an approach for, um, the, because many of the, um, I, I would say a lot of the situation facing the autonomous vehicle developers are pre-competitive. So yeah. it's faced face by everybody. And so sharing data help themselves too. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so that's the thing. The safety is a public good, right? Just as you mentioned, aviation industry, companies do not compete on safety. Safety is everybody's bar here, right? Yeah, but you, you, in road traffic, somehow we don't behave in the in a similar way. So last question from me, and I'll give it to John for the question uh, from the audience question. It's about the testing program, right? As you mentioned that, uh, each company have their own testing program, which is proprietary. And then you as a researcher making a lot of contribution, try to bring this uh, 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 academic type of uh, testing environment. You then also mentioned that the federal government should probably play a role in have us uh, to design or, or implement standardized testing program, et cetera. Or potential insurance companies should have some sort of a testing before they agree to do that. So how do you see this? Uh, this whole community evolve into the future here, right? What would be a ideal process where we have a share knowledge sharing and a coherent thing, coherent testing structure for everyone? Yeah. So um so um in the automotive industry, self-certification is the norm for yeah. human driven vehicles. Yeah. Okay, so we you know, we essentially we don't have any um, any regulation before the vehicle is being released on public road. If anything happens, then we investigate, and so we rely upon auto manufacturers to self to certify these vehicles themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and and um, one of the things I want to mention 
is not for human driven vehicles. And so uh, we do, uh, as of now, we do license drivers, right? So mm-hmm. the driver has a writing test and has a, has a um, 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 you know, on-road testing as well. Now, when we put autonomous vehicle, these drivers, computerized drivers and the vehicles together. And w- from our experience, uh, we, test, uh, we test these, um, you know, uh, open source automated driving system. We test some of the commercial system as well. We see the needs to have basic behavior competency, t- com- competency test before these vehicles need to be uh, allowed to be on the public road mm-hmm. because it could become a public hazard. It's already demonstrated in, the te- in, in some of the situations. And so public, uh, uh, I would say federal government does have a role to provide some basic behavior competency testing. Mm. And so, so that's my argument to, uh, you know, to, uh, to Associated Press and that's why they make, you know, they, they, they have the new story. And nice. obviously for insurance companies, they want to have more in terms of more comprehensive in terms of accident rates and so that how they can calculate in terms of insurance, insurance premium as well. Mm. But at the, at the minimum, the federal government need to be stepped in to uh, to ensure some of the um, uh, uh, you know public safety aspect. That uh, also uh, I want to mention that's important, uh, not only for the from the government perspective, hmm. but you know improving in, in improving in terms of consumer confidence um, hmm. in this technology, right. and also um, if we do um, regulate if we do uh, self certification when anything happens, there's Really, um, the company, the AV developers, take the sole responsibility to, to it. So that's also why you, you see happens, um, you know, Uber's accident and and cruise ac- accident, and both of in both of the situations, the companies are significantly impact were significantly impact. Right. So I think there's a true need from the federal government to act on it. Right. So that's where you have the part one being the driver license test, part two being the intelligence test. So you're saying yes. part one is the minimum that everybody should do. Part two is, I think. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. So yeah. now let me give the form to John for the question from the audience. Super. Thank you so much, Henry. We had a really super active chat and the the questions were really covering a diversity of topics. So I'm going to I'm going to take a shot here and start with I think one of the fundamental streams of questions was around A-B testing. And I think uh, Stephen Schladover asked okay. a very good question, okay. which is okay. how large the question is, how large a suite of A-B test cases will be needed to provide a statistically valid comparison of AV safety with baseline human driving safety. And I like this question because it speaks to the curse of rarity that you opened with. So do we have a sense of that? I mean, how much more, how many more test cases do we need for an autonomous driven vehicle versus a a human driven vehicle? Steve, uh, thank you. I know Steve for a long, long time um, when I was a postdoc. Um, I think what I would advocate from, um, you know, in terms of um, safety test testing perspective, we move not only in addition to the scenario based, the test case, the, the, the case based approach into a more what I like to call it is driving environment. So not built upon essentially just the test cases or scenarios. If you look at the company, any of these uh, you know top autonomous vehicle companies, they probably have millions of scenarios, and that's still not enough. And every time they have a new release, they have to you know go through all these millions of scenarios, and, and it's just not enough. And they still have um, difficulty. So I I, I would think that. In the future, we need to be able to model in the simulation in terms of the city level driving environment better in a digital twin so that you know the vehicles essentially driving within the replica of this vehicle uh, of the city and to test it out. And then through some sort of acceleration approach, even not our approach, but through some other acceleration approach. 
And so just testing these case by case or scenario by scenario, you can guarantee you can get some sense in terms of your basic behavior competency is really hard to get to in terms of what would be the um, you know comparable accident overall safety performance. So just to make sure I understand, so basically what you're arguing is through the the digital twins, through simulation technologies, now we can we can really move beyond scenarios into just millions and millions and millions of miles of driving situations. And that becomes the new sort of paradigm for for testing the a b intelligence. That's true. That's what I'm advocating. And then um, but also, um, you know, on Tuesday when we have the open um, open house event, and we also, you know, announce we have a partnership between MCity, MITRE, and also NVIDIA to build this digital proving ground and has both approaches, scenario-based approach and also the driving environment-based approach. Okay, just on the topic of testing, so Stephen Zoff asked a question. What it and this is when you were speaking about the licensing and the the AV intelligence tests. He asked a question: What is the level of accuracy of vehicle position detection via the sensors? So, how consistent is this accuracy across deployments? For example, lighting, elevation, angle, etc. Yeah. So in our testing, uh, we use RTK type of, um, you know, GPS. Um, and, and, and so, uh, we are, you know, in our, in our case, we test specifically on the decision making capabilities. So I would assume, um, you know, if we take autonomous vehicle as a black box, these vehicles essentially has, you know, has their own perception, whatever these, um, 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 um capabilities then we are providing really the background um, uh, situations in terms of infrastructure, in terms of the, the background vehicles, pedestrians and things like that. And then the parameter, essentially the accuracy is on these background agents and then controlling their trajectory on certain times coordinated with the position of the, the autonomous vehicle. So that's why in our test track, we use this RTK GPS to get into the you know, in, 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 essentially the centimeter level of accuracy in terms of position. Okay, let's shift gears completely. There were there was a series of questions and comments around the role of autonomous vehicles in society. So I wonder if you have comments on that. So, for example, Paulina de la Riva asked the question, she said, one concern of mine is that the popularity of autonomous vehicles leads to an even more car-driven design and infrastructure instead of prioritizing communities and the humans in urban spaces. So this is how sort of, you know, an urbanist would look at this. Do you, do you have thoughts about sort of the impact of this technology? It sounds like long-term you're quite positive and you really see this progressing but what does that mean for our sort of the car dependent world that we live in it, do you have thoughts is that actually the future that we really want that's a very important question for any uh, autonomous vehicle deployment for the developers um, um, and also for the city government city or county government um this is uh, one of the I, I would say this is one of the questions on their you know, on the top of their list. So how do we ensure equitable type of deployment for this technology? And one of the things I want to mention is um, there are use cases, um, you know, for example, for those people who are, for, for example, for our elderly population, then, then they don't really have a form of transportation um, uh, readily available to them. A town vehicle, vehicle will be able to provide mobility to them. Those certainly will be, um, 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 interested uh, will be um, you know really really useful helpful on on that type of situation, 
But then there's argument and also the research demonstrated if you just do not uh, regulate or do not uh, have any policy guidance, uh, what happens is, you know, uh, there's a lot of these vehicles running around that will be a lot of congestions, you know, essentially also yeah. uh, provide, uh, you know, essentially the um, negative externalities to uh, to the society as well. So um, I don't have a solution to it um, and, and this, this happens every time when sort of disruption occurs, um, you know, when red hailing vehicles come on, um, there's, you know, um, there's, I would say there are similar type of, um, of situation occurs and there's research and to show how we can really guide um, the, the developers or the companies to do um, further, further their deployment so that they can um, ensure some equitable and uh, uh, deployment. So, I can only say that I'm not expert on that. So I can only say, um, I also call on federal government to support more research on those. Fair enough, fair enough. And it's it's a big, it's a very big question. You know, it really comes down to, it's a values question essentially. So we can, diff, reasonable people will probably disagree on the path forward. Um, Let's shift gears again. There was a series of questions around autonomous vehicles and the built environment. So uh, David Delgado asked the question, is it possible uh, or just unreal to eventually reach a network of autonomous vehicles in which a mesh is eventually created and intersections no longer require signaling or lights? To which Jane Chu responded, this makes me wonder if separating AVs into dedicated spaces or lanes much like bus rapid transit would improve traffic efficiency and safety overall until the mesh is achieved. Thoughts about the built environment and sort of unique opportunities or requirements for autonomous mobility and how we design our, our roads and our, our streets. Yeah. Um Signal free uh, intersection operation has been an active, to active research topic in the last like 20 years also. And I agree. I, I do think um, if we into a hundred percent autonomous vehicle, there's really no need for uh, traffic lights because traffic light is essentially provide indications for human drivers um, in terms of their maneuvers. Um, but I do also think that some sort of coordination mechanism, um, the, the control mechanism is still needed at the intersection. Um, it's 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 just not in the form of physical traffic light. Without some sort of controlling mechanism, you know, congestion will be um, become a lot more severe, and and then so the you know the mobility will become a problem. So we you know how how the autonomous vehicle may help on you know safety problem, but then if you don't have any coordination or control mechanism at the intersections, they create a lot of congestions. So I I do think that will become an issue. Uh, yes. Sorry to interrupt. Yes, it's already one why. Uh, Henry, there, there's so many questions in the chat. I saw yes. that. Okay. We could do one hour on this, right? Uh, but thank you again for joining us. For everybody, please join me. Thanks, Professor Henry, Day for the presentation and conversation today. Really thank you for the invitation. Yeah. Thank you. This is wonderful. So, Henry, if you don't mind, I'll create a break, breakout room, just a short conversation from the Oh, sure. Yeah, of course. Of course. For everybody else, so thank you again. We'll have a good weekend. I'll see you next, fr next Friday. Bye bye. Uh -huh.